partner, systemic rival and competitor. That is how the German government describes its official stance on China. But what does that actually mean in practice? To delve deeper into the complexities of the relationship and how Chancellor Olaf Scholz's visit to the country could reshape economic ties, I'm joined now by Holger Goerk, Director of the International Trade and Investment Research Centre at the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. Holger, Scholz has brought a big delegation of German business leaders with him to China, including the heads of Mercedes, BMW, Siemens, BASF and Bayer. What message are they collectively hoping to deliver to Chinese leader Xi Jinping? Well, I think in so first of all, I think he has quite a balancing act to do because he is trying to balance the, say, the business um, needs of business interests in China. So there's a lot of German firms in China and they are hoping to increase their market access, get better market access, uh, have a level playing field and so on. So there's a lot of business interests in China that where, where, where we see China as a, a large and expanding market, an important market for a lot of German firms, in particular in the car industry, but not, not exclusively so. And the balancing act is there because, of course, we're now in a time where for the last two, three, four, five years, people have realized that China is um, not just a market, but perhaps also, as the EU calls it, a systemic rival. So there are concerns, geopolitical concerns about uh, the, the increasing dependency on China. There are concerns about spying uh, and so on. So it, it's a balancing act he has to take here. Uh, and uh, of course, as you already said, the bringing a large delegation of German firms, very important German firms, bringing their CEOs sends a clear signal that he is very interested in strengthening these economic ties and, uh, and having China as, a, as an important market for German firms. Now, one company that is not part of the delegation, though, is Germany's largest car maker, Volkswagen. This seems like a big omission, given how strategically important China is for VW. Is there anything we can read into this? Well, there has been a, a lot of discussion recently uh, about, uh, in particular, Volkswagen's, uh, VW's um, uh, new investments or existing investments in China. Um, so, yeah, so, the, so there is a concern, but, but this also applies to a lot of the other companies that are there. So um, I'm not sure I would read too much into this uh, omission into the fact that Volkswagen isn't there. Uh, there might be a lot of reasons for this. I, I think it's clear that other car makers are there and they will, um, I, I'd say, also be quite happy to to um, to uh, follow up uh, on the concerns of German firms in China. OK, I want to talk about some research that Kiel Institute recently produced, looking at the size of industrial spending in various OECD countries. China comes out top, spending close to 2% of its total economic output on supporting domestic businesses, especially benefiting companies like electric car maker BYD. Now, industrial spending, it includes things like access to cheap loans, tax incentives, as well as direct subsidies. But there is also another category you call China at specific factors. What are they? So I think, I mean, first of all, it's important to, to notice that, yeah, the, the China is very, does very heavily subsidize its industries. Um, and that is a potential concern, uh, in particular for the EU and also for the US. And the, the question is, are these subsidies there to create an unfair advantage for the Chinese industries or not. And the, the, this is going to be a, a big discussion um, in the EU and in the US. Um, and a lot of uh, work has to go into this to, to make a, a case for whether or not it is uh, uh, an unfair practice. Um, so yes, China, it's very, very difficult um, to get access to data to actually measure how important are uh, subsidies in China. Um, it, it's not particularly transparent, um, to, to put it uh, in a diplomatic way. And I think issues that are particular for China are, for example, so there are um, 
uh, I guess what, what one might call demand related subsidies. So subsidies to consumers to buy a particular um, to buy particular homemade products. Um, and I think what's also important is uh, in these China specific uh, issues that there are also say if we're talking about the the electric uh, vehicle uh, producer. Um, so there are, of course, also subsidies along the supply chain, particularly in China, that play a role here. So for the say for the car producer, for the electric vehicle producer, it's important that also the battery production is subsidized in China. And this is, gives uh, this is an indirect, um, if you like, an indirect subsidy to the electric vehicle producer that we try to measure, but it's difficult to, to exactly see uh, what's going on in the data. The other thing that strikes me about this research is that the numbers relate to 2019. Now, that is before the US Inflation Reduction Act and the EU's Green Deal Industrial mm. Plan, both comprising massive state support for clean energy. How different would things look if the data were updated to include these two spending programmes? They would look a bit different. So here again, we are at the the so the the, the point really is that it's very very difficult to get this kind of data for any country, um, but it's particularly difficult uh, for China. Um, so 2019 was a year where we could actually get a lot of measures um, that we that we then included in this study, or that my co-authors or that my uh, that the authors of the study included in the in, in this study, um, and. Of course, China has also, uh, since 2019, continued subsidizing its industries. Uh, and you, you rightly point out, so have uh, the US and the EU. So the numbers would be a bit higher, uh, I guess, now for, for the EU and the US. But I think we would still see that, a country, that China in particular is very, very, um, well, far ahead of, of, say, the US and the EU, um, which, of course, we should keep in mind um, may also be because they are, um, no, you, you compared it at the beginning to OECD countries. China is not an OECD country. And so in, in some sense, it's, it is still an emerging economy and emerging economies uh, do also subsidize their industries and have different industrial policies than highly developed industrial countries in the OECD. So that's one aspect to be kept in mind. But nevertheless, even uh, I'm sure even if we looked at data from today or 2023, we would still see that China is far ahead of, say, countries like the US or, or regions like the EU in terms of subsidizing industries. Another aspect to this is that without Chinese subsidies, certain products that Germany needs for its green transformation would actually get more expensive. Is it in Germany's interest to demand a reduction in state support from Beijing? Now, that's a, a very good question and a, a very important issue um, that it's not really so clear what uh, what the German economy actually, or what the German politicians actually want, and certainly uh, what German industry wants. So subsidizing on the one hand, the, the main argument is, oh, China subsidizes its industry. This could potentially lead to unfair advantage in that Chinese firms are subsidized, can produce at lower costs and can enter other markets. So that's the, the main argument um, for this. But on the other hand, subsidizing, so China subsidizing its industries and for particular goods also creates an advantage, certainly for consumers here in Germany or in the EU or in the US or so around the world. So these goods, solar panels, electric vehicles become cheaper through these subsidies. And that's a big plus, a big advantage for consumers in the economies. Um, so. This is one particular point. And then, of course, even car makers, if you talk to car makers here, and if you if you look at the, the recent reports, uh, they are not so sure they really would like to see um, the EU or, or so the EU in particular retaliating and, and making electric vehicles from China, for example, more more uh, more costly through tariffs because they know that this could then lead to a trade war between 
the uh, EU and China, and this would have negative consequences for all of them. Because remember, um, the Chinese market is a very important market still uh, for uh, for German car makers in particular, but for a lot of German companies uh, in general. So relations between these two countries um, are important, or good relations between these two countries are, are important for the uh, for German businesses. It is an incredibly important relationship. And yet Germany, along with the rest of the EU, has been talking about de-risking its ties with China. But if we look at direct investment in China from Germany, it reached a record high last year, up more than 4%. And crucially, that rise marked an increase in the overall share of its foreign investment too. If de-risking isn't about reducing the size or the share of investment in China, what is it about? Yes, uh, uh, I also noticed that. So the, the, the FDI, so investment from German companies into China is now at a, um, a record high, 13 billion, if I have the number right, in 2023. And uh, about 10% of German investment went into China. Um, so it's a huge, it's of huge importance uh, for the German economy. Um, what about de-risking? Um, Yes, yeah, so this is a bit of a, I, I suppose, a balancing act, perhaps, perhaps a conundrum uh, in itself, because yes, politicians in particular at the EU level, but also at the uh, at the German level, do talk about de-risking and that it's important to reduce the dependence um, on China. Yet you see that a lot of particularly German companies are still expanding into that market. Um, you don't see this for the US. The US, for example, if you see their de-risking strategy is very clear, they well, were perhaps never as, as dependent on China as the EU is uh, or has been in the last three years. And they have also managed to not increase FDI, so their, their dependence on China in the last few years. Germany is going a very different way, and perhaps this indicates, well, there is, uh, and perhaps it's a good thing that these business people are with Schultz on a long flight, so they actually have time to talk uh, about uh, their strategies and see, do they actually fit together? Because uh, to an observer like me, they don't really. So there's de-risking. De-risking would mean you have to reduce your dependence on one particular market. You, there are lots of ways of doing this, going into other markets um, or reduce or, or spend or selling more at home and, and also procuring more at home. So there are different ways of achieving de-risking, but de-risking certainly would, or, or certainly it's very difficult to reconcile de-risking with increasing your investments, increasing your activities in, uh, in a country from which you want to de-risk. Would it be fair to say then that Germany is not de-risking its relationship with China? <laughs> Um, well, I, certainly based on the on the overall numbers, um, I find it very difficult to to see how um, how we have a de-risking at the moment um, with yeah Germany still expanding, so a lot of German firms investing, um, and also uh, and also China is still the main trading partner um, for Germany as well. If you consider exports and imports together, it's the largest in 2023. It's been the largest uh, trade partner for Germany. There is another interesting side to this, because while the big German companies are still very reliant on China, the smaller and the mid-sized companies known as the Mittelstand, they actually have been reducing their dependence on Beijing. Why and how have they been doing that? That's right. So I, I think um, we see a difference in how the very large multinational companies behave like the car makers, for example, but, but also others. Uh, and then the the middle stand, so the, the smaller firms, perhaps family owned um, and being leaders in, in particular sectors, so niche markets, as we call them, or hidden champions, as we call them. Um, and of course, these companies are much smaller and have very different strategies. and. Of course, if you just think about the sheer size of, of a company, so Volkswagen or BMW, of course, are heavily invested in uh, in China, but they're also large companies. So they also are 
operating on, on other markets in the US, for example, and, and these markets are also very important to them. So um, whereas for a small and medium sized firm, if you specialize into a particular product, into a particular niche and into a particular country like, like China, um, then of course you have to reduce your dependence perhaps much more quickly than if you're dependent on this on this one particular market, um, then you need to you need to readjust your portfolio. And I, I think that's what we're seeing. So large companies perhaps don't care too much about it because they also have the other markets that are important to them. SMEs, the Mittelstand, they are much more dependent on one market um, and um, yeah, therefore see a much greater need to actually um, diversify into other markets. And where are these middle shunt companies going? Are they are they going to India, for example? So, of course, that really depends on what exactly they're doing. I, I think so you see um, quite a bit of uh, of new trade or new or new linkages with or, or increasing linkages with EU countries. So that's so they're going back to their home region, if you will. But also, yes, India is an important and increasing market. Um, so, so we see a lot more um, activity there. But then there are also um, other countries like Brazil uh, in particular, I think, uh, is a growing country. Philippines, Indonesia um, are, are growing markets. So you also see these, um, these countries um, gaining um, and, and middle stand, so smaller companies going into these countries. And one trend we've seen in China is that domestic demand has remained stubbornly weak. How much of a concern is this for an export reliant economy like Germany's? Yes, it's a, it's of course uh, it's of course a, a concern. Um, but I think you, you again to, to to relate this to the to what's going on. So obviously companies in particular, so the, the large companies obviously still see China as a large and also growing market. Um, otherwise, why would you have these new investments? Why don't you have why would you have these strong ties uh, with the with China? Um, so businesses obviously still think that China is also a growing market, which it is um, to some extent. Um, and um, yeah, so I think um, even though, yes, we we do have concerns about perhaps a slowing demand in China, slowing local demand in China, um, it seems that companies assume that this will only be temporary and that we will we will see the end of this fairly soon. You mentioned the differing relationship that China has with the US earlier on. Um, we have an election coming up this year. Relations under Biden have already been very strained on issues ranging from chips to a potential ban of TikTok. Another Trump presidency could make ties even more unpredictable. How does Germany intend to position itself in the context of this tumultuous relationship? Yes, I think the US-China relationship is uh, is fraught with difficulties, uh, to put it mildly, perhaps. And, and I mean, interestingly, it hasn't really changed tremendously uh, between Trump and Biden. So in tone, of course, it has. But in, in terms of what's actually happening, uh, it hasn't. So it hasn't really eased. And yes, Trump would certainly make it more unpredictable. Um, but in what way, I, in whether it would really get even tougher is a question we'll um, perhaps see in, in, the, in the future. But, but I think the relationship hasn't really changed in the last five, six uh, years or so, um, irrespective of who's president at the moment. And I wouldn't expect this to change dramatically either. So where does Germany uh, position itself? I, I think that's a very interesting question and uh, perhaps we'll know more after the uh, meeting between Scholz and the Chinese counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think what's important is, first of all, that uh, I think the question shouldn't be where does Germany position itself, but where does the EU position itself? I think 
the EU, so countries like Germany, France, um, and perhaps also Britain, even though they are no longer part of the EU, have to realize that, well, they're really too small to do anything. And so if we as Europeans want to have a clout in, in, in dealing with China, it has to be at a European level, uh, where also, of course, trade policy is set at a European level, not at a country level. So uh, I think to really be taken seriously, this has to be at the EU and Scholz should make that very clear that he's a representative of the EU, um, as well as, of course, a representative of Germany. Um, but yeah, I, I think the EU, certainly in the last few years, uh, has tried to be yeah, somewhere in the middle between um, um, ch between the US uh, and China. And perhaps uh, if you think of it in terms of the murder mysteries, you have the you have the bad cop, which is the US, and the good cop, which is the EU. Uh, so trying to go the route of negotiating and the route of keeping communications open and, and not escalating it into a trade war. And I would expect and perhaps also hope that this is a, a, a way that the EU would also continue to do. Um, even or particularly if uh, the presidency changes in the US uh, and also we'll have to see how European elections pan out and what the majorities are here. But I think the EU certainly at the moment is very, is reluctant to go the, the full way or the, the, the uh, full way towards escala escalating relationships uh, and keeping communicating and more trying to keep communications open, keep the exchange open and see um, that there is a business relationship or an economic relationship between these two countries that uh, should be fostered. We were speculating earlier that Scholz could have used his flight to discuss economic strategy with some of Germany's business leaders, but it strikes me that that conversation was probably cut short by the news of Iran's attack on Israel. Mm. Um, China's relations, relations with Russia are, of course, also a source of tension. To what extent is it possible for Scholz to separate business and politics on this trip? That's, um, yeah, I, I think that remains to be seen. I, I think the Iranian attack on Israel um, haven't made uh, things easier for him. Uh, I think also, what we heard in the last few days, so that China um, is also, of course, increasing its its um, its assistance to to Russia um, doesn't make it easier. Uh, I think it's going to be very, very important uh, to to make that point that yes, one has to try from his perspective, from Scholz's perspective, to to talk about separate issues uh, and contain them. So uh, I think the relationship between China and Iran is, is one aspect, the China relationship between China and Russia is another aspect, uh, and then the relationship between the EU and China, um, and here in particular the economic or business relationship uh, is another aspect. Um, but of course, disentangling these, these different issues is going to be very, very tricky and Perhaps we will see that, yeah, particularly with recent events in the last couple of days, the uh, Iran's role or Iran's attack on on Israel, this might just dominate uh, the um, the meetings, the political meetings he has. Um. So a lot of compartmentalizing, if I'm understanding you right. Holger Gug, Director mm. of the International Trade and Investment Research Center at the Keel Institute, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure.